All right. So, um, well, thank you, uh, Lisa, uh, for the introduction. Um, I am very happy to share this panel with Santiago Levy. Santiago is going to talk about the case of Latin America. So, <clears throat> for purpose of division of labor, I will focus on Africa, in particular, Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I will talk about uh, the green shots of social assistance in particular in the region. So you have to uh, excuse me for generalizations that I will make, but uh, this is for the sake of um, simplicity uh, when I go through all these topics. <clears throat> but I want to start by saying that we have witnessed uh, like an emergence of social assistance in the global south in general. So um, um, I would say primarily these new institutions are in the area of social assistance. And one of the things that have characterized these in new institutions is that they are poverty focused. And they, can see, they are seen often as complementary policy tools that are required to reduce poverty in combination of economic growth, basic service provisions, and so forth. So if you look at this graphic, it <coughs> illustrates the, the race of these uh, social institutions. Um, by the early 90s, there were really very few uh, social assistance uh, programs in the world. By 2012, there were more than 160 programs uh, operating in the developing world. So as you can see by different types of programs, the, the, uh, the increase in the number of human development cash transfers in Latin America has been in particular important. But at the same time, other kinds of policies, including social pensions, um, are worth mentioning. And also, perhaps other categorical programs that usually focus on households and families in vulnerability. So this increase in social assistance has been very important and uh, we can refer to as a new wave in new policy thinking in the developing world. So uh, as I said, I will focus in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has, over the last 10 years, include social protection and when we read social protection in that context, we usually think about social assistance, but many of these uh, policy tools have been um, included and even adopted, at least on paper, on the national social protection strategies in, in a number of countries, and the living stone process uh, through the African Union, uh, in a way, agreed to push the, the agenda of social protection forward, and, uh, and also, um, Social protection has been increasingly uh, seen as an important policy tool potentially against uh, major aggregate shocks like food um, and financial crisis. And these ideas are coming uh, primarily from the experience of Latin America. So these are, in a way, the green shoots of social assistance in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, but the, the green shoots are very diverse. They are very heterogeneous and complex. So, we have <coughs> observed um, a typology that is characterized by pure income transfers, primarily categorical, based on age, either social pensions or focusing on families with households in the southern part of Africa. Um, whereas in the rest of the continent, in the West, uh, East, and Central Africa, it, there is a much more heterogeneous um, typology. Some programs focus on human development and they provide transfer to families with children, whereas others are public works, primarily providing cash uh, on a temporal basis to uh, young people with strong enough to provide work in, in exchange of income. And also more complex um, policy tools uh, that combine asset protection and asset accumulation, like in the case of the Ethiopian productive safety net program, but these, these are very uh, specific cases, but overall um, this typology is highly complex and, and what we see is that one of the main institutionalized programs are primarily in the southern part of the continent. Um, these are middle income countries, 
and with relatively strong institutional and also more fiscal space to sustain these programs. It is less clear, though, um, the models that we observe in the rest of the continent. So, uh, and the reasons, I think, uh, response to many things, in, in particular the origins of social or the welfare institutions in, in Africa, whereas the southern part of Africa, in a way, um, emulated the experience of European welfare systems and was introduced in the 90s, in particular in South Africa and other countries in the southern part. Um, well, in the rest of the, the continent has been uh, primarily driven by donors. So donors have been playing a very substantial role and we see a transition from food aid characterized in the 80s you know, towards a transition uh, to income transfers. And this is also the response of a number of factors, including conflict and major shocks. So African countries experience shocks, in particular conflict, uh, and these uh, emergency and humanitarian crises were responded by food aid, which uh, have been uh, transformed into more um, institutionalized forms of income transfers. There are other forms as well of social protection in the continent that are more indigenous, which responds to the way societies have organized. And this can take form of savings and also insurance schemes that have been there for, for centuries. But in, in, in effect, the major two or origins of social assistance in the region responds to either uh, the influence of European settl settles, settlers or the influence of donors more recently. So um, from this kind of uh, landscape, we developed a, a kind of typology. Or we identify two models. We call models uh, the MIC model, which, as I said, is more dominant in the southern part and, uh, and is characterized by a strong um, particip participation of the state. In the southern part, in a way, the participation of the state was the response also for the reconciliation process that southern African countries went through. No? So social pensions became an instrument for social cohesion and, um, and in a way that provided incentives for the continuation, expansions and strengthening of these institutions. Um, some countries like South Africa has experimented with other modalities, but, in, but uh, primarily the main or the flagship programs are more age-based, categorical uh, designs. The less clear model, what we call LIC model, which is uh, a more dominant among low income and lower middle income countries in Africa, um, have been the response of a number of things, as I said, usually food and, um, and conflict uh, crisis, but also the transition has been more complex. And uh, one of the things that we observe is that is often driven by donor priorities. And, uh, and also, uh, this is more diverse in the design. So whereas some are pure incomes, pure income transfers, others combine incomes with the utilization and provision of social services. And there are a number of ex examples in Kenya, Malawi, Ghana, and other countries. Other characteristic is that many of these programs are pilots. They don't have the scale that we observe in, in southern African countries. Um, and then the level of institutionalization is much more uh, uncertain about the long-term sustainability of these programs. So um, other factors that also have, in a way, strengthened the, the, uh, the MIC model is not only conflict, but also the, uh, the demographic and other kind of health shocks that the region has experienced, in particular HIV. No? So with the HIV pandemic, we suddenly many countries found uh, many thousands of orphans without the care of, um, of uh, individuals. So many grandparents, in particular grandmothers, took, uh, they started to take care of these uh, children. And then suddenly, social pensions became not only an instrument against poverty in old age, but also became a very effective uh, policy response to this kind of crisis coming from HIV. You know? And this is of a different level of magnitude that the kind of 
the signs that we observe in Europe because in Europe um, we don't have the same family structures or the functionings that we observe in Africa. So because we have these family institutions in which families respond to vulnerability of members of the family, then the social pensions have become a very effective way to deal with child poverty. Acknowledging that, of course, no all the children have grandparents. Um, the government and the South African government explore new uh, programs and they introduce uh, the child support grant. But all these responses have been really driven by domestic uh, forces and dom domestic dynamics. Um, the LIC model um, is really very different in, in, in the sense that has been uh, also the consequence and the response in a way for a number of factors. First of all, the economic growth that many African countries in the region have experienced in the early 2000s. But also other things like debt relief, um, the discovery of natural resources, in principle open the fiscal space no? for many countries to explore these uh, new policy uh, strategies. And also donors have been changing their priorities over time, in particular since the 90s and the introduction of the MDGs. So, so we see a uh, transition from the donor community from more product productivist approach to a, you know, investing in physical infrastructure like in the 60s and 70s, moving towards investing in human capital. So all these kind of um, transitions have been important to understand this, what we call leak model in social assistance in sub-Saharan Africa. There are two main shifts that we observe. One is this shift from food aid to cash uh, transfers in the context of humanitarian assistance, which is an important thing, but not necessarily in the domain of social assistance, which usually have to deal with much more longer term, regular, reliable transfers to households in, in poverty and vulnerability. So um, as I said, the, this typology is complex and um, and it is very hard to predict how the leak model will transit. No? So we don't have a clear idea about how these institutions will evolve on which direction they will take um, in, the, in the following years. Um, some of these institutions have uh, got some momentum because of the fiscal space that was generated, but now with the, the crisis that many countries are facing and the co with the commodity prices going down, there is a level of, of uncertainty about this. Um, so I want to say that there are mainly three determinants of what may explain the development of these institutions in the future. Uh, primarily financial, institutional capacity, and then very importantly, the politics and the political economy dimensions of these institutions. So um, the first dimension, which is financing, of course, is an, a very important one because if you start to really simulate the cost of these programs, you soon realize that although for some countries are financially viable, for most low-income countries, they are still very expensive. If you look at the cost of this program when you, for example, estimate what, how much would it cost like to to finance a basic pension, a child-focused transfer, an unemployment insurance scheme. All of these programs vary between 3 and 6% of GDP, which is not uh, small for a low-income country. But then when you start to look at how much those programs will absorb in terms of government revenues, the amount is dramatic. No? So when you see the, the needs of these countries in terms of infrastructure, investment in the schools and uh, security and so forth, becomes a very complex issue, in particular in, in political spheres. It is very common when you discuss with, fin with finance ministers, they are very reluctant actually to to, to uh, scale up these programs. And it is obviously the, they have very lim limited incentives when the capacity to redistribute and raise uh, uh, taxes is also limited and inadequate. So um, the reasons why it's, it's difficult is because the structure of the economies of these countries are complex. No? So they are still very dependent on agriculture. The informal sector is very extensive, so it's very difficult to tax. There are also institutional and administrative limitations, and as I said, political economy factors, because many of the uh, uh, governments in these countries are um, 
operating in very imperfect competitive political regimes. So they have incentives often to avoid taxing, for example, the rich, no? to finance these kind of schemes. But uh, nevertheless, having said that, um, there are still some potential opportunities um, and we explore this in a number of papers that we have produced. So, so the first one was what well, was the um, the ability of countries to redistribute. No, so in, in another way, what would be the minimal tax rate on the rich in those countries necessary to reduce or eliminate the normalized poverty gap? No? So we did some very basic estimations, and then as you can see, the the minimal tax rate would be simply prohibited because very few countries have this, uh, the capacity to redistribute money from the rich to the poor. So redistribution is perhaps a more longer term strategy and, um, than these countries can adopt, but in the short term or medium term is very unlikely to happen. These are just financial considerations without the political economy aspects of that. No? Then resource mobilization, um, well, there are a few potential avenues, as I said, revenues from natural resources. Although, as I said, we, the, the variability in commodity prices is very uncertain, but then certainly some opportunities there. There are also quite a few risks. Um, besides, um, you know, corruption, there are also certain behaviors that, uh, as I said, are very unlikely to happen unless systems become much more competitive. Then um, there are some possibilities shifting expenditure uh, from subsidies or highly regressive expenditures to, to expenditure on the poor, like the experience of Mexico. No? So now the, the question is, um, in a way, this is very uh, an important point, but there are risks as well, because what we observed in Nigeria in, two, in 2012, no? when the government decided to undo the fuel subsidies, and you see these massive demonstrations to the extent that the president was forced to stop no? the policy reform. So these are important things which are very unclear, and, um, and although there are some potential avenues to increase the resource mobilizations, are not necessarily clear to what extent they will be efficient and, and sufficient to, uh, to be implemented by governments in the region. The institutional capacity, well, uh, as you can imagine, some of these governments have very weak institutions and that, therefore they have um, uh, resorting to community management and a mix of providers. And, and some people who advocate these kind of practices argue that they can foster you know, more awareness from local elites and they provide the engagement with these groups. But at the same time, <coughs> uh, based on what we have observed as well, is that you can replicate um, well, some kind of um, social disparities that exist in the community. So, so whereas engaging with local elites uh, can be very important as well, if there are existing uh, discriminatory uh, norms, they, they are more likely to be reproduced and reinforced. So these are things which are some of the risks of uh, uh, depending on this kind of institutions. Um, for uh, the, the southern um, um, African countries, I think they've been much more engaging with the private sectors. And this, this is what we observe as well in Latin America now. You know? So the government has full control of the programs, but now they are private, um, uh, services, uh, uh, private service providers who are more increasingly uh, engaged in the provision of cashes. Uh, so, of course, the, the main challenge for those countries is to improve the quality of the services that are together provided by these uh, uh, institutions. But going back to the political economy considerations, so as you can see in the map, um, there have been important democratic transitions in the region you know, from the 80s, where the, the majority of countries were a, really a, a, a autocracies, um, there has been a, a transition to more, relatively more competitive regimes, but nevertheless, uh, there are important challenges. The other important factor is that they, we know much more about what works. So research has, in a way, facilitated that. So the number of impact evaluations and studies that were produced on social assistance institutions since the 90s has been tremendous. You know? So we know much more about what works in this area and um, has been quite important for replication processes in this, in this region. So this 
as donors like to call it, the evidence-based agenda has been quite uh, important in that respect, at least in sub-Saharan Africa. No? But the fact is that we um, still uh, don't know too much about what is going to happen. And rather than to give answers here, I just want to put forward some, some questions that we have and for, as we call it, the future for development economics. So, so we have more questions than answers on these topics. But, uh, for example, we don't know what does the emergence of these institutions mean for welfare institutions in the region. So what we know or what we could predict in the leak group of countries is that social assistance may lead to new institutions, new, new institutions that may be poverty focused. However, in middle income countries, um, this emergence of social assistance has also led to parallel institutions. You know? Parallel institutions that have also important implications. Uh, you have a system that you have contributory and non contributory schemes, often based on the concept of citizenship. You have life course protection vis a vis basic protection. You have insurance against contingencies, often life course contingencies, vis a vis investment against structural poverty. So these are kind of parallel institutions which we are not clear what would be the final outcome or how the institutions will evolve over time, but these are important considerations that we don't know at this present time. So we either don't know um, what are, in a way, the implications of these transitions for the economic and social development of developing countries in more general. And we don't have clear theoretical guidance as well no? about what we may predict um, from these transitions. Um, from economics, we can, um, in a way, predict what um, more opportunistic uh, incumbents may, may uh, how they behave, but we are not certain. So we have some ideas about uh, what can happen, but then there are more questions than, than answers in that respect. So in order to address these questions, I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk about what we are doing here at WIDER. So we have uh, a project, uh, but then uh, part of this project is trying to build a uh, new database, no? a database that is compiling information about uh, social assistance institutions. The idea is to collect information in a longitudinal form that will collect uh, specific indicators on programs, institutions, and political economy dimensions. So, um, so um, these are a number of um, uh, reasons why we have done this. B we believe that um, they're important uh, positive externalities from developing databases, but at the same time, there's a huge gap in knowledge about, about these topics. So uh, the SAPI aims to contribute in that respect. So this is uh, generally the content of the SAPI. The, the database will be available uh, at the end of this year. So I invite you, if you're interested in these topics, to use the database. and. Um, and, uh, well, I can leave it here just by concluding that, well, um, we are not clear about the direction towards social assistance is, is uh, leading in the, in the sub-Saharan African region, but there are important considerations. Um, these are primarily related to domestic institutions uh, and financial um, aspects that um, will, in a way, predict or shape this, um, this uh, processes. And um, donors and foreign aid has uh, always uh, been uh, uh, an active uh, agent in that process, but uh, donors had not necessarily um, worked effectively with governments in the region, so there is a lot of room for improvement in that respect. So I leave it here, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.